All right, guys, we're going to go over classification today. So species of organisms. There are 13 billion known species of organisms. This is only 5% of all organisms that have ever lived. New organisms are still being found and identified. So what is classification? Classification is the arrangement of organisms into orderly groups based on their similarities. Classification is also known as taxonomy. A taxonomist are scientists that identify and name organisms. So the benefits of classifying. We want to accurately and uniformly name organisms. Prevents misnomers such as starfish and jellyfish that really aren't fish and uses the same language, Latin and some Greek, for all names. The confusion in using different languages for names. So here we have a picture of a skunk and the different scientists are calling it by their its common name for the different languages. So if you don't speak another language in the science, you know, in the science um, era, that you're not going to understand what they're talking about. So we use the same language, which is Latin or Greek. So the same picture, and this time they're calling it by the skunk by its scientific name, which is Methodist Methodist. So remember, scientific names have two names. You've got your genus, which is your first word, species, which is the second word. So an early taxonomist. 2,000 years ago, Aristotle was the first taxonomist. Aristotle divided organisms into plants and kingdoms, or excuse me, plants and animals. He then subdivided them by their habitat, land, sea, or air dwellers. <coughs> so the next um, taxonomist we have is John Ray, who was a botanist. He was the first to use Latin, but his names were very, very long and descriptive, telling everything about the plant, so nobody could really wanted to say the word, the names. Then we have the guy that we give credit for. Carlos Linnaeus. He's an 18th century taxonomist, classified organisms by their structure. He developed the naming system we still use today. So Carlos Linnaeus is called the father of taxonomy. He developed the modern system of naming known as binomial nomenclature. It is a two-word name of made up of the genus and species. So standardized naming, we're going to use the binomial nomenclature, so it's made up of genus and species, it's Latin or Greek, it's italicized in print, so if you're going to read it like on the computer screen or print it in a book, it'll be italicized. We're going to capitalize genus, but not species, and if you're going to handwrite it, you need to make sure you underline it. So here in we have, this is an American robin, the Scientific name is Turtus migratoris. So Turtus would be the genus. Notice it's capitalized. Migratoris is the species. It's not capitalized. So Turtus migratoris for the American robin. So here we have three pictures. If we look at these three pictures, we have our giant panda, the polar bear, and the grizzly bear. And we can look at their scientific name, and we can tell that the polar bear and the grizzly bear belong to the same genus, which means that they're probably, you know, they could be like cousins, they're more closely related to each other than they are to the panda. So there are some rules for naming organisms. It has to go through the International Code for Binomial Nomenclature. All names must be approved by the International Naming Congress, so this prevents duplicate names. Classification groups. We have a ta uh, taxon or taxa for plural, which is a category into which related organisms are placed. There is a hierarchy of groups from broadest to most specific. So we go domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So domain is our broadest. Then we go to our kingdom. Kingdom is broken down into phylum. Phylum is broken down into class. Class is broken down into order. Order is broken down into family. Family into genus. And then finally, species. 
Oops, let's go back really quick. So domain, we have three domains. We have six kingdoms. Kingdom is broken down into phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So we're going from a very large category to a very small, very specific, talking about one, um, one species. So if we look at this, we're going to start with the kingdom Animalia. We've got the grizzly bear, the black bear, the panda, the fox, the squirrel, coral snake, and sea star. So this is all the animal kingdom. But if we want to break it down into the phylum chordata, chordata meaning it has a spinal cord, we're going to leave off the sea star because the sea star does not have a spinal cord. So everything in this phylum has a spinal cord. Now we want to talk about just the class mammalia, or mammals. Well, a snake is not a mammal, it's a reptile, so it is no longer in this class. So everybody in this class has the fact that they are mammals in common. We want to get even more specific, we want to talk about order carnivore. Okay, well, our squirrel is not a carnivore, so we're going to leave the squirrel off, and now we're specifically just talking about the grizzly bear, the black bear, the panda, and the fox. We want to break that down into the family, family Ursidae. So here we're talking about the panda, the black bear, and the grizzly bear. So now these three are relatively closely related, but we want to break it down into the genus Ursus. So now we're talking about the grizzly bear and the black bear. And then finally, species, the species Ursus arctos, where we're talking about just one singular organism. So we can come up with an acronym for this to help us remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, sorry. We've got King Philip came over for gooseberry soup. Or however you want to, it'll help you remember, you can make up your own um, acronym. But we need to remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Largest to smallest. So if we wanted to talk about the classification of humans, we could start with the domain Eukarya because we are eukaryotes, cells with nuclei. We belong to the animal kingdom. Phylum chordata because we have a spinal cord. Class mammalia. Order primates. Family hominidae. Genus homo. Species homo sapien. We are the only organisms in that category. So our domains. Our domain is the broadest, most inclusive taxon. So we have three domains. We have archaea and eubacteria, which are unicellular prokaryotes. Remember, I wrote prokaryote. It's no nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. And then our last domain is eukarya, more complex and have a nucleus and mem membrane-bound organelles. So our three domains, archaea, eubacteria, and uh, eukarya. So archaea live in harsh environments and may represent the first cells to have lived. If you think of archaea, think archaic. Archaic meaning very old. So here we have an image of the archaic bacteria or archaea bacteria. So they're going to live in the harsh environments like sulfur springs, uh, volcano vent, volcanic vents, something where most any other organism on Earth can't live is where you're going to find your archaea bacteria. Are you bacteria, some of which cause human diseases, are present in almost all habitats on Earth? You bacteria is the bacteria that we normally think of when we think here the word bacteria. Um, for instance, E. coli, or the strep throat, which is the bacteria that causes strep. Many bacteria are also important environmentally and commercially. Commercially because they help make cheeses and yogurts, certain types of foods, beverages. Environmentally because they break down nitrogen in the atmosphere and turn it into a usable form is the only way that we can get the nitrogen is through bacteria. Bacteria and plant roots turn that into a uh, usable form. The plants use the nitrogen. We eat the plant. So our domain eukarya is divided into kingdoms. We have protista, we have fungi, plantae, and animalia. So the, the four kingdoms under eukarya and then you talk about um, Archaic bacteria and new bacteria make six kingdoms. Protista, most are unicellular. Some are multicellular. Some are autotrophic, while others are heterotrophic. 
So you're usually going to find your protista, such as uh, protozoans, like kind of like an algae, in the water. Fungi, fungus, most of us know what mushrooms are. Multicellular, except for yeast. Yeast is the single cell organism. Uh, they're absorptive heterotrophs, which means they digest their food outside of their body and then absorb it. And then they have cell walls made of chitin. Plantae, most of us know what plants are. Multicellular, autotrophic, absorb sunlight to make glucose through the process of photosynthesis. Cell walls made of cellulose, and we cannot digest cellulose. Animalia, so we belong to this category. Uh, multicellular, ingestive heterotrophs, which means we have to consume food and digest it inside of our bodies. We feed on plants and animals. So here we just kind of have a universal ancestor. Here we've got um, our protista, our plants, fungus, animalia, archaea, and new bacteria, kind of showing where everything is related. Talks about this slide talks about all of our kingdoms again, the eukaryotes, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. So most genera contain a number of similar species with the exception of Homo that only contains modern humans. Classification is based on evolutionary relationships. So we can see according to this diagram that here we have about 751,000 different types of insects. Other animals, about 281,000. You, the kingdom you bacteria, there's about 4,800 different known species. Viruses are not a living organism, but there's about a thousand known viruses. Um, your plants or your fungus, um, we've got 69,000 different types of funguses. Protozoans are your protista, about 30,000. Algaes, 26, close to 27,000. And you got different, lots of different types of plants, looking at close to 260,000 different types of plants. So the basis for modern taxonomy, we've got our homologous structures. Remember, same structure, different function. Similar em embryo development, and then similarities in DNA, RNA, or amino acid sequence. So we've talked about homologulus when we talked about evolution. So remember they show same basic structures just used for different functions. So similar structure, different function. We've got our embryology. Remember we all start off at very similar stages of life. As you start to develop, you start to differentiate into the different organisms. We have a, what is known as a cladiogram. It's a diagram showing how organisms are related based on shared derived characteristics such as feathers, hair, or scales. So this cladiogram, we have our organisms on the top, characteristics on the side. As we go this way, we're talking about time. So here we're talking about oldest. Here we're kind of talking about the, the newest. So if we want to start with vertebral columns, we're going to say that everything in this category has a vertebral column. So we're going to move up to a new characteristic, jawbone. So now we're saying that the grouper, basically and up, will have a jawbone. We want to break it down into four-leg locomotion. So now we're, we're leaving out the grouper, the lamprey, and the lancelet. So now we know the salamander, the turtle, and the wolf all use some type of four-leg locomotion. We're going to break that down into amniotic eggs, turtle and wolf. And then finally hair, we're just talking about a wolf. Kind of similar, showing characteristics between the different types of primates and a human. We've got a lemur, spider monkey, reese monkey, chimpanzee, and the human. We want to talk about every organism on this slide has four kinds of teeth, movable head and front-facing eyes, large brain, omnivorous, five digits on hand and foot with opposable thumbs. We want to break it down and just to the category when we're talking about central eye area for more acute vision. So that's the, the spider monkey and up. Our next characteristic is downward pointing nose, reese monkey and up, loss of tail, chimpanzee and up, 
And then loss of opposable thumb, human, or excuse me, loss of opposable thumb on foot. So dichotomous key is used to identify organisms. Characteristics given in pairs, you read both characteristics and either go to the another set or identify the organism. So if we wanted to identify this, we're always going to start with 1A and 1B. You read these, and it'll tell you where to go. So it doesn't matter what picture you start with, you always go back to 1A, 1B, read the statements, and it'll tell you what it is.